how are you doing this morning? Can you hear me, Laurel? Uh, no? I don't know if she has our sound. Can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear our audio? I don't think she can hear us. Good morning, Laurel. Can you hear us? Good morning. I can. Okay. We can hear you now, but we don't have your audio. I'm going to see if uh, our crews behind the scenes can work on getting your audio up. Copy. So Marcus, how, how's the audio? Okay. Still. Sure. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Awesome, Laurel, we have your audio. Thank you so much for joining us. All yeah, right, so coming. we'll just get right into it. How are you feeling? This is your first mission into space. Are there nerves working? Tell me how you're feeling. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I am feeling very excited, of course. Um, it's also funny just as we're getting into these final few weeks before launch, um, I've just been so focused on training and final exams um, here in Star City uh, that I kind of forget that I'm actually going to space. And then every now and then it'll just hit me that our launch is in a couple weeks. Um, and that'll just be in little moments. Like um, a couple weeks ago, I video chatted with Frank Rubio, who's on board space station right now, waiting for me to get there so he can come home. Um, and he was talking about setting up our crew quarters um, or, you know, our, our personal hygiene stations where we take showers. And it's those just little details of daily life that, you know, suddenly jolt me. And I realized, oh, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to be on board the International Space Station. So I'm guessing it's exciting. It is very exciting. Now, you talked about uh, hygiene and things like that for people at home. How does one take a shower or, you know, bathe in space? <laughs> uh, it's kind of a, it's a longer process than on the ground because we don't have running water, of course. Um, we actually use bags of water and towels. And so we just, um, it's a process of, for example, washing your hair, squirting a little bit of water onto your hair, uh, rubbing some soap into it, and then just doing that over and over again until you've gotten all the soap out. Uh, so it takes a little bit more time than it does on earth. And what, and what was the preparations like preparing for this, the, the training that goes into preparing, I guess, your body and your mind to head into space? Uh, well, I've been training for two years now, um, and of course, doing all of the technical training to get ready for the mission, um, but then also doing a lot of physical training to prepare my body um, just to be in space, um, to hopefully get to do some spacewalks um, and to be as strong as I can um, for the mission. And then also uh, mentally just um, preparing myself as I go into all of these different training events, um, trying to think about, you know, when I'm doing this on orbit, what it's going to be like so that I can train the way that I'm going to fly. What inspires you to be an astronaut? Um, I've wanted to be an astronaut since I was a little kid. Um, I grew up in Houston, um, as you know, and so I had NASA right down the street and growing up, I always wanted to be an explorer. I was always dreaming about far off places and cultures and people that I'd never met. Um, and be having that early exposure to NASA at NASA Johnson Space Center, um, just at, from an early age, I latched onto the idea of being an astronaut. 
Do you have any advice for young girls who may want to follow in your footsteps? Um, yes, I'd say do things that scare you. Um, all of those new experiences help to broaden your horizon and help you learn both who you are and learn about the world. And before you leave us, we need a shout out for Houston, of course. Anything you want to tell your hometowners? Uh, just that I can't wait to see Houston from space, and I'm looking forward to sharing the mission with all of you. We really appreciate you joining us. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us, Laurel. Thank you. Hey, how are you doing? This is Bill Harwood, uh, CBS News at the Kennedy Space Center. Hi, Bill. Great to hear from you. Hey, it's nice to hear from you. It really is. Um, you know, I've only got a few minutes, so I'm just going to jump right in. And, and one of the questions I always have for folks flying up on the Soyuz is, is tell me your impressions of your crewmates. Um, what's it been like working with them and, and uh, certainly and with Oleg, with all the expertise he has, lessons learned and that kind of thing? How's that been going? Um, yeah, it's been going well. I am excited. Uh, obviously, Oleg Kononenko is an extremely um, experienced commander. Um, this will be his fifth mission uh, for Oleg. And so um, it's been really neat to get to work with him and learn from him as we go through all of our Soyuz training. And then our pilot, Nikolai Chub, um, he, this is his first flight, so it's neat to get to share that with him. Um, and he is just extremely technically competent. And so it's been a lot of fun getting to work with both of them. Has, uh, has Oleg passed along any, uh, any good advice for you? Uh, just this is a benefit of his experience? Uh, yeah, just share. He's shared some things about just living life on board station, um, taking photographs from the space station, for example, and then just uh, what the whole experience of launch and um, like ascent and docking and the mission will be like. You know, I've always thought that uh, people from other countries that, that become medical doctors in a different language is an incredible challenge, but it strikes me that learning Russian and the ability to fly in a Soyuz spacecraft has got to rival that. How is how is the language <laughs> thing going with you? How, how is that well, going? Well, we actually... <laughs> we have doctor. We have people. We have astronauts who are both doctors and learn Russian and fly Soyuz, so they're very impressive. Uh, Russian is probably one of the more challenging parts of training for me. Uh, learning languages definitely doesn't come easy. Uh, but once I started traveling here, um, first as the director of operations in Star City, and then for training um, and learning more about the culture and making friends here, um, it's gotten easier and easier to to learn language and be motivated to study all the time. And one question I've always had is when you take your qualification exams over there, 
how tough is that? Is that like an exam? I would have a college level exam in a technical subject that you're doing in a second language. Um, yeah, so we actually just finished our qualification exams. Um, I had the Russian segment, so Russian side of space station exam on Monday, and then our Soyuz qualification exam yesterday. Um, and those are they're challenging, but um, it's really in the breadth of inf the breadth of information that we need to know for Russian segment, for example. Um, it's everything from how this the technical systems work to um, doing um, public affairs events to taking photos, and so. Um, it's just this wide variety of, of work that we need to do. And then the Soyuz exam, of course, is always very challenging and fun um, because the instructors just throw failure after failure at us and the crew has to learn, has to figure out how to respond to those failures. You know, speaking of that, you know, with the, with the progress of Soyuz coolant leaks, I'm just wondering what's, uh, what, and I realize that those are kind of a little bit open issues, but uh, apparently a coincidence, but what's your confidence level in the, in the vehicle you're going to be uh, trusting to ride to orbit? Um, I have no doubts uh, about the Soyuz that we're going to fly. I'm, I'm very excited about it and getting to fly Soyuz. Well, one more question along some of those lines, and I, this is not a political question, I swear, but I'm, under, I'm interested since your previous, before you were assigned to this mission when you were working in Moscow and now that you are assigned to the mission, what is it like at the working level, working with the Russians, when there's this obvious conflict between the two countries? I mean, how um, does everybody I, get along? Um, I would say there's no change. Um, my crew is very focused on launch. All of our instructors are very fo focused on getting us ready. And just at a broad level, NASA and our, our space station partners are all very focused on safe and professional missions. You know, I've heard you say that you grew up in Houston and that you wanted to be an astronaut from a young age. When, when did that first occur to you? And when did, it, when did you realize it was an actual possibility? Um, so my parents told me that I've been talking about being an astronaut since I was around eight years old, so second grade. Um, I got to fly some or grow some tomato seeds that had flown on space shuttle, and that was kind of my first interaction with NASA at that age. Um, and then, uh, honestly, I'm not really sure when I thought it would become a possibility. Um, I had gone off into ocean science and was doing ocean engineering, um, but I always had it in the back of my head that I should at least apply. Um, because if you don't apply, there's 0% chance of becoming an astronaut. So um, I applied a couple times, and then um, I was pretty surprised to get to interview and then have the honor of being selected. And, and you've kind of addressed this, but, but from a personal standpoint, I mean, I think the prospect of flying in space must be, you've, you've already said this, really exciting, obviously, but you know, what are you looking forward to? I know everybody looks forward to the view at the cupola and, and being weightless. I've been in the in the vomit comet and had a little bit of weightlessness, you know, 30 seconds at a time. And it was so magical. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine six months of that. So is, is that really the, the top of the list? Uh, yeah, it's hard to imagine because um, I did have that limited microgravity experience, what it's going to be like when, um, when we're actually in space in those first few minutes where we're weightless and then that just doesn't go away for six months. Um, so I'm looking forward to that feeling. Um, and just kind of lear learning how to live and work in space, um, li do all of the daily tasks, you know, that you would do normally here on the ground, and then also um, all of the science and maintenance that we're going to get to do. Um, so just kind of that day-to-day -day experience of working in a 3D environment versus a 2D environment. Um, and then I'm also just really looking forward to the relationships with my crewmates that I'll have and, and with everybody on the ground and just getting to share that whole experience with everybody. Yeah, and this, and this is kind of a dumb question because I know you're really looking ahead to the very next flight. But, you know, the Indians just successfully landed their lander on the moon near the South Pole today, just a few minutes ago, actually. Uh, pretty neat mission. And obviously there's a, a really renewed interest in the moon. Is that something that would interest you down the road? And, and I do realize that's a dumb question to ask somebody who's getting ready to go off on a six-month trip to the ISS. But the moon's out there. Just curious what your thoughts are. Definitely. Um, I think every, I think all of us would love to go to the moon. Um, it's a super exciting time to be at NASA right now. And I can't wait to do this mission and then also come back and support Artemis II and the future Artemis missions in some capacity. Uh, it's going to be awesome. One last question. Um, I know that everybody who goes to the station wants to obviously do a good job when they're there. Is there it, do you have any concerns at all about your six-month stay? And I don't mean concerns about safety or something like that. I just mean in terms of getting the job done that, that you're, you're assigned to. What do you think the biggest challenges will be? 
Um, I think it's a good question. And I think for me, one of the bigger challenges that I'm anticipating is just not being able to go outside. Um, spending time outside is important to me and it's kind of how I recharge my batteries. So I think it'll be really interesting to just see what it's like living in an environment where I can't just, you know, pop out doors for a few minutes um, to relax at the end of the day. Um, but, and then also just the challenge of it, we're going to be very busy on board. So there'll be a lot of work. Um, but I think um, even challenges like that are um, just something I'm looking forward to embracing and adapting to um, because the environment is new and it's going to be so interesting. Well, I wish you the best of luck. Uh, I hope to talk Thank to you, you in orbit and I hope that, uh, well, I hope you get a chance to walk outside. Who knows? But, <laughs> but anyway, I hope you have a great flight. Looking forward to it. Thanks. Thank you. Hello, Laurel. It's Elizabeth Howell from Space.com. How are you doing today in Russia? Hi, Elizabeth. Thanks. I'm great. That's great. I know that it's uh, quite a familiar location to you, given that when you qualified as an astronaut, you became the astronaut office's director of operations in Russia. And so uh, can you talk a little bit about what you were doing during that time? Um, yes. So after we finished our initial two years of basic training, I came out here as the director of operations um, to work in Star City. So NASA has a training office here, and I was supporting 
um, all the crews and training that come through Star City. And then before you joined NASA, what drew you to your work on uh, marine science underwater vehicles at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution? Um, initially, I applied to that job because I was interested in designing and building and testing hardware. Um, what kind of hardware, I wasn't very picky on. Um, but then after I got to Woods Hole um, and got involved first in an upgrade to the Alvin, um, prod, Alvin submersible, which is um, a, a manned research submersible, um, for the United States. Uh, once I got involved in that and then in a bunch of other projects at Woods Hole, um, I became um, pretty passionate about my work there and, and was, was very excited to be there. <laughs> and what's the biggest lesson you took from your submersible research that you think is going to help you during your mission? Uh, lots of things. I think there's a lot of overlap between oceanographic research and spaceflight. Um, probably some of my most... Um, the experiences that are that will help me the most and that are also the most memorable for me is all of the time that I spent at sea working on research vessels. Um, I think those are very analogous to a space flight in that you're uh, working in a fairly remote environment. You have a limited set of tools available to you, so you have to um, do all of your work with whatever you have on hand, um, the materials that you have on hand, and then you're also just working in a small operational group. Um, so um, getting along with your teammates, um, you, you know, dealing with issues as they come up and just kind of working through all of those challenges uh, is very similar. That is totally relatable experience. And then um, as somebody who's obviously spent a lot of time working on vehicles that are in the water, does that um, affect somehow your perspective of space vehicle activities such as docking or capturing them with uh, the robotic Canadarm2? Um, it's definitely something I've thought about a lot while I was doing all of my spacewalk training. Um, I, kind of, I would I kind of joked about it, but uh, I worked on remotely operated vehicles. So those are tethered vehicles that are tethered to the ships. And similarly, as astronauts, when we're doing spacewalks, we're tethered to space station. And so tether management was important, both in my work at Woods Hole and then also as an astronaut. So it seems like all that time working in the water sort of helped with uh, working on the spacewalk training, didn't it? Yes. 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 <laughs> Wonderful. Um, do you have any special ocean or sort of watery locations that you'll be watching for when you're on the space station? Um, yeah, I'm excited. Well, I'm excited to see all of Earth's oceans from space, particularly some of the more remote places that I didn't get to travel myself. Um, and I'm also looking forward to keeping an eye on where all the ships that I've worked on will be located and trying to spot them from space station, or at least wave as we fly over. Exactly. Um, I know that with a couple of hundred experiments, it's really hard to pick favorites, but what are some of the science investigations that you're looking forward to doing? Uh, there's a bunch. Uh, at any time, we have about 250 experiments going on on Space Station, both inside and outside. Um, obviously, as astronauts, we only work on a portion of those. Uh, one of the experiments that I'm excited to be a part of is the Cypher experiment, uh, which is an ex actually an experiment on me. Um, it's 14 different studies uh, that are focused on all sorts of aspects of human health, um, everything from bones to psychology. And so I'm excited to be a part of that um, to help us learn more about how the human body adapts to the space environment and hopefully be able to take those lessons learned on future uh, longer duration missions to the moon and then to Mars. That's great. And uh, what kind of community outreach will you be doing while you're up there? Um, so we usually do about one or two outreach events per week, um, and we do that with uh, people from all over the world um, in the United States. And so I'm excited to get to do all of those events. And then I'm also excited to get to talk to uh, the universities that I went to, get to talk to Woods Hole um, at some point as well. Um, I know that part of the thing about being an astronaut is what you have this journey and you're able to sort of talk to others about that journey through these events. And so what kinds of things do you try to emphasize to maybe students or uh, younger people that would be sort of looking to follow in your footsteps um, as they begin to progress through their career? Uh, well, one of the most in ex inspiring things to me about being a part of human spaceflight is just the message that I think that the International Space, space Station provides um, and that is um, how much we can accomplish when we work together um, across, you know, between different countries and, and different groups of people. And so um, that is one message that I hope to share while I'm on board Space Station. Okay, Laurel, thank you very much for your time and good luck. Thank you.
Europe. Good morning, Laurel. How are you? Morning. I'm great. Thanks. I'm uh, Jay Blackman. I'm the producer at NBC News. I'm very, very excited for you. Thank you. I'm also very excited. Well, that's actually my first question. It's your first time in space. Um, tell me what you're feeling right now. Um, I'm feeling a lot of excitement. Um, I've been focused really hard for the last couple months and weeks um, just on finishing training, uh, both first in Houston and then now in Russia. We just finished our final exams yesterday, actually. Uh, so I've just been very focused on preparing for the mission. And uh, now I get to, you know, kind of shift my focus a little bit to going down to Baikonur next week and then launching in a couple weeks. Um, and so just through that, it's kind of been this surreal experience where I'm so focused just kind of on the day-to-day -day tasks that I sort of forget that this actually all um, ends in launch and a space flight. But every now and then um, I'll remember that and those moments will hit me and it's it's pretty amazing feeling. And you will um, you will be, you know, looking down on an earth that isn't exactly the most peaceful at the moment. What, um, and I, I'm sorry I'm asking this question, but because you've been asked it, I'm sure, 20 times this morning. What are, what's it like to work with the Russians at the moment with U.S. relations not being as great as they could be? I know that space is apolitical. I'm, I'm assuming that you're going to hope to keep it that way. Yes, um, I would say both um, in all of my experiences here on the ground and also on board the space station, um, our relationships are the same as they've always been. Um, we are just focused on the mission, focused on launch, and NASA and our partners are focused on safe and professional operation of space station um, and in all of our human space flight operations. Is it a topic that you ignore with your Russian counterparts? Um, yeah, we're we're just you know focused on getting ready for launch at this point. It's it's been very busy with all of our technical training. So it's it's an exciting and it's a great time to to be in your business at the moment with everything that's going on with the moon and with Mars and, and things like that. You could potentially be on an Artemis mission. How would you how would you feel if you were chosen for that? And, and what do you think of this exploration? It is a busy, busy time at NASA. Um, it is. It's a super exciting time to be a NASA astronaut and to work get to work at NASA. Uh, there's so many different things going on. We have space station. We have Artemis, and we have all of these new commercial ventures related to space station. And so um, there's all these different things. Uh, to work on right now. And I would be absolutely thrilled to be a part of Artemis. I'd be thrilled to um, continue to be involved with the space station program. Um, there's just a million different things I'd like to do after this. Is there anything that you're bringing to space that is particularly meaningful to you or to your family? Um, yeah, I'm bringing, well, I'm bringing a bunch of things. Um, a couple of the personal items that I've chosen to bring are a couple of journals, just blank note, blank page journals and some drawing pencils, uh, because I know we're going to be really busy and the days are just going to fly by. And so I want to be sure to record um, all of the little moments that I don't want to forget, um, either by writing about them or sketching. I like to, I like to draw and, and do art. And so I want to capture all of those moments because I think one of, um, you know, one of the main reasons that we're there and that we have the International Space Station um, is to share that human journey. So I want to make sure that I don't forget all those moments. And, you know, STEM is, is a huge career field for young people. What's your message to people, to young men and women or young boys and girls, I guess you know, I should say, about space? Um, I think there is, um, in the space program, um, space, room for everybody. Um, we have astronauts, of course, but and we have engineers and scientists, but um, we also are supported by so many people. Um, we have doctors, we have lawyers, uh, we have publicists. So if you're interested and passionate about space and exploration, then there's a place at NASA for you. When you were a young, young girl, did you ever 
dream that you'd be living on the space station and floating floating up into the cupola and look down on Earth? Is that something that ever crossed your mind? Um, it definitely crossed my mind. I've wanted to be an astronaut or I've been dreaming about being an astronaut since I was a little kid. And I definitely thought about it a lot um, when I was in high school in that age. Uh, but I, you know, dreamed about it, but I don't think I ever, it w feels surreal that I'm actually doing it. I don't, I don't think I ever thought it would actually uh, be reality. And if you get chosen for Artemis and you get chosen to walk on the moon, what would, what would that mean to you? Um, that would be, of course, very meaningful. Um, it would be um, amazing. I think the most um, sort of emotional moment for me would be to be standing on the moon and looking back at Earth and just seeing our planet in its entirety in the blackness of space. Um, I think that would be a pretty powerful moment. And what are you, what is it that you're most looking for? Obviously, there'll be a lot of work on the station. Um, your days are not your own uh, and, and heavily scheduled, but what is it that you're most looking forward to up there? Um, I am looking forward to work wise, um, just kind of getting to work on the variety of science that we get to do um, and then getting to fix things. I really enjoy that. I'm also excited. We have two spacewalks scheduled this fall in October. And so I'm hoping to get to do a spacewalk um, on one of those. And um, also just the kind of day-to-day -day living and working in microgravity with my crewmates. Talk about some of the science that you hope to do. Uh, we have a wide variety of science going on. One of our spacewalks is actually called microorganisms, and we will be um, going out the door to um, spacewalk uh, around on space station and swab different vents outside of space station to see if there's any microorganisms from inside surviving in the space environment. So I think that will be really neat and interesting. Um, there's a lot of medical research going on. I'm part of a very big study called Cypher, uh, which is uh, this compilation of 14 different uh, medical research studies studying the effects of the space environment on the human body. And then also I, a lot of life science experiments that I'm interested in working on. That's all I got. And I think I'm running out of time. Laurel, have a, a great safe trip. Um, and we're looking forward to maybe talking to you on orbit. Thanks. That would be great. Thanks for the questions. And take care. Hey, Laurel, good morning. This is Sherry Williams from your old school district, Fort Bend ISD, and I'm here with the student, Juhi Gudboli, who's a junior at your old high school, Clements. Good morning, Sherry and Juhi. So I'm I super excited to talk to you guys. <laughs> well, not as excited as we are, and the current principal of Clements is also here in the room, so we're all very proud, as you might imagine. 
I know it can be a long road to become an astronaut. So how long was that road for you? And what was your reaction the day you found out you made it? Uh, that road was long for me. I, I've been dreaming about, I, about being an astronaut since I was a little kid. Um, so it's definitely something I've thought about for a long time and something I thought about a lot in high school uh, while I was trying to figure out what to do with my life. Um, the day that I found out, I was at home from lunch, uh, at home for lunch from work, and I got a phone call. I knew uh, we had been told that they would be calling everybody that day. So um, I was expecting a phone call, but it was a pretty surreal moment when I heard that I was being invited to come down to Houston. I hung up the phone and immediately called each person in my family to share that news. You know, when you say you want to be an astronaut and you say you thought about it since you were a little girl, it's almost like telling people, I want to be a movie star. I want to be president. And people may pat you on the head and say, well, good luck with that, because that's a surreal goal. Uh, but did you ever have anyone in your family who, from the beginning, was like, absolutely, you're, you're going to do that? Yeah, I think so. One of the reasons that this feels so special to me, especially getting ready for my first mission, is that my family was so supportive the whole way. Um, I said I want to be an astronaut, and they were always just kind of like, well, yeah, yeah you should do that then. Um, so I've just had this incredible support and encouragement um, throughout my life. And now Juhi has some questions for you. Hello, Ms. O'Hara. My name is Juhi Godbole, and I'm a junior at Clements High School. And it is a very surreal moment talking to you. This has always been one of my dreams. <laughs> But the first question I would like to ask you is, what inspired you and gave you courage to become an astronaut? Um, I've had a lot of inspiration throughout my life um, from people I've gotten to know and work with, from my family. Um, and I, but I think some of the best advice that I was given early on was that you, there's no chance that um, you can become an astronaut or do anything that you want to do if you don't try. And so. Um, even when, even before I think I met the minimum qualifications, I tried to submit an application and then um, each and just tried a couple more times before I actually got selected. So um, I was just encouraged to, you know, go ahead and try, even if you're not sure if you'll be successful or not. And for those, for someone who wants to go into this field, what would they have to do in high school in order to reach their goal, or what maybe what courses would they have to take in order to be be successful? Um, I think in high school, really, um, the best thing you can do if you're interested in, in doing something like this or anything um, is just study all of the different subjects um, as hard as you can, because um, it really, you know, becoming a well-rounded person is important no matter what career you choose to pursue. Um, so um, studying hard in school, you know, playing sports or doing something athletic just to stay in shape and take care of your health, those are all important things to do in high school. And finally, what advice or encouragement would you give to someone that would like to pursue a career in STEM? Um, I would say to do things that scare you and don't be afraid to um, ask or ask for things that you want. Um, find a good mentor. Um, look at people who have who have similar careers to the one that you want to pursue and, and try to get in touch with them um, and just, you know, see how other people have gone through those journeys. Um, but most importantly, don't be scared to take those first steps. Thank you so much, Ms. O'Hara, for your time. So, Laurel, you. uh, Juhi here says that she may want to be a doctor at NASA. And there are so many different things that people can do as part of NASA or even their contractors. Can you list some Absolutely. fields that people may not think about? Uh, well, one thing that we like to say is that um, you can do anything at NASA that you could do in a small town. So we have everything from doctors, we have lawyers, uh, we have artists, we have um, you know graphic designers who support us and so uh, or who work at NASA. And so um, you can do almost anything that you want to do and be supporting the space program. What do the graphic artists do? <laughs> Uh, so all of the materials that you see coming out of NASA from posters to videos, um, they put those together. They design the patches that we use and that you see for all of the missions and um, things like that. Did you go to any Fort Bend ISD schools besides Clements? 
Uh, no, nope, only Clements. And First well, Colony Middle School. First Colony Middle School. Well, you picked some good ones. So can you speak to how specifically Fort Bend ISD equipped you for what you're doing now? Um, yes, I so I feel very fortunate to have gotten to go to Clements, um, First Colony and Clements. They're both excellent schools, and I feel like they um, prepared me really well. Um, so I understand and appreciate the impact of that opportunity that it had. Um, it was very good, a good foundation to launch my education from. Do you have any specific memories or teachers from Clements that you recall who had impact? Our theme this year is know your impact and choose to care. Is there someone who embodied that for you when you were a student here? Yeah, I had a lot of great teachers. Uh, one of the things that took up pro a lot of my time in high school was art. And so uh, my teachers, Mrs. Doyle and Waterman, Miss Waterman, um, were very, you know, very uh, influential characters in my life. Um, and then I also did cross country and track and my coaches there were also very special. Uh, did you know that Clemens is celebrating its 40th anniversary this month? In fact, there's going to be a party August 31st. I know you're in Star City, Russia, so I guess you can't make it, but do you have a No, message? but I did hear about it. Congratulations. That's great. <laughs> uh, do you have a message for them? Uh, just keep being excellent is what I would say. Um, it was an awesome opportunity to get to go to school in Fort Bend. And this will be your first space flight, correct? Yes. So what do you think that's going to be like? Uh, not many people in the history of man have ridden a rocket into space. Um, what do you think it's going to feel like, smell like, uh, sound like, all of it? Um, I don't know yet, but I will tell you when, after I do it. Um, I think it's going to be just an amazing experience. Um, just being in a completely new environment, like space flight is something that we train for in all different kinds of ways on the ground, but we don't actually know what it will be like to um, be on the rocket and be in microgravity until we're doing it. And so I think just that whole experience of adapting to a brand new environment and working under all the different challenges that we'll have while we're on board um, is something that's going to be uh just an incredible experience. And lastly, what do you think will be your prevailing emotion, wonder, fear, excitement? Um, I think a mixture of wonder and gratitude to get to be a part of this mission. Well, we're grateful that you're going. Godspeed. And thanks for talking to us today from Star City, Russia. Thank you. Hey, good morning. Well, not good morning for you, but <laughs> um, thank you so much for taking good time afternoon to talk for to me. me. Good morning for you. <laughs> um, well, you know, congrats on the upcoming mission. I'm curious, you know, you're the second Houston area astronaut, so 
I want to start off with how do you feel about representing Houston in this way that obviously not only you train here, but you lived here? Uh, it's very special to get to train and work um, in my hometown, and I'm excited to uh, fly and get to see Houston from space and represent Houston in space, along with Shannon Walker, our other Houston astronaut. Yeah. Um, and are you planning to bring any like Houston-specific mementos up with you? Um, I don't think I have any Houston-specific stuff packed right now. <laughs> what do you have packed? Um, I have uh, a few things. A few of my personal items are journals that I'm taking, um, blank journals to record just details of the mission that I don't want to forget um, so that I can come back and share them. Um, and then also some art supplies because I really enjoy doing art. <clears throat> oh, what kind of art? Um, like painting, color pencils? What are you thinking you'll be able to do? Um, I really like painting, but I am not bringing any paints to Space Station. I'm just bringing drawing pencils and paper. Yeah, I imagine paints would be uh, much more difficult. <laughs> It'd be, be a little bit trickier. Um, well, how long have you been in Russia? And tell me a little bit about what your training has been like so far. Um, so I've been here on this trip for three weeks, um, but for the last two years, I've been traveling back and forth between the United States and Russia, and then also our partners in, in Germany and Japan. Um, so I've been training since June of 2021, um, and that's been everything from uh, space station systems to spacewalk training to Soyuz systems um, here in Russia. Okay. Um, and so this is going to be your first trip into space. Uh, what are you most looking forward to? Um, I'm looking forward to first um, just getting to space and seeing Earth for the first time from that viewpoint. Um, you hear, you know, everybody who's been up to space talk about it, um, kind of about how it can be this life changing moment. And so I'm excited to um, get there and see it for myself and experience that for myself. Um, and then I'm also really excited to see Space Station in person um, because we do all this training um, both at the Neutral Buoyancy Lab in the pool doing spacewalk training uh, where we're looking at the outside of Space Station and then also in um, some of our mocked up facilities where we do training uh, for the tasks that we'll be doing inside the Space Station and just um, seeing this incredible um, you know, engineering marvel that we've created this laboratory in space um, in person for the first time, I think is going to be also amazing. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, as a newer astronaut, this will be your first mission, but you'll be part of, you know, kind of NASA's next step forward to commercial space stations to um, uh, the Artemis program. And so I'm curious how you think uh, this first trip to space station will prepare you for those and what are you looking forward to next? Um, yep, so this mission will definitely, uh, for all of us first-time flyers, um, it'll help us get our space legs and learn how to live and work in the space environment. Um, and then after this mission, after once I get back, I'm looking forward to, I've uh, mission-wise, I have no idea I'll be happy to do anything, um, but I'm looking forward to getting back and rejoining the office and supporting all of the different missions that we have going on, um, supporting Artemis II, supporting continued space station operations, um, and just getting involved in a couple different things that I haven't been able to do yet. Yeah, um, but is there like a mi mission you're most excited about? Like, um, or is there a part of NASA moving forward that you're most excited about, whether it be, you know, the potential to go to the moon or, or to see commercial space stations, you know, this next iteration of this engineering marvel you just described? Is there something that's um, most exciting for you? Um, there's no one thing that's most exciting for me, um, but I have been supporting space station operations pretty much since I started at NASA. So I think it would be interesting to um, get to do a little bit of work in exploration, like related to Artemis or in commercials in the commercial crew program, uh, just to get exposure to all of the different programs that we're working on. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I was looking at your bio again this morning and I saw that a lot of your experience for NASA was on submersibles. And obviously it was very different than, um, you know, the submersible accident that just made recent headlines. So I was curious if it made you think a little bit about, um, you know, the implications of, of that um, accident and going forward with space travel. Um, did you have any of those thoughts when you heard the news? Um, not really related to my mission directly, um, but... Of course, um, 
we understand the risks that we're taking and we do a lot of training to mitigate those risks um, and be prepared to deal with you know, any situation that might come up. And so I feel very prepared for the mission um, and ready to handle you know, any kind of experiences that we might have while we're on board, um, either during launch or, or, or during the mission. Yeah, I guess I'm sorry. I guess I meant more along the lines of, you know, um, uh, this new aerospace is starting where we're getting a lot of commercial participants going into space. And, um, you know, obviously the Atlantis one was a, um, a commercial, like, a tourist ride. And so I was just curious if you if you thought that could hurt, like, the commercial side of space as it was moving up. Obviously, I know everyone's prepared for safety, and I know your mission is very different than the commercial missions, and obviously you're a professional astronaut. But I was just, I was just curious if you had any thoughts around those. Um, no, I don't think that will negatively impact, um, you know, commercial space flight. Um, that we're committed, NASA's committed to supporting our commercial partners and our commercial partners, I know, are all also very committed to safety. And so um, in any new industry, um, things like that can happen. But, um, you know, step by step, um, we're making it happen. Yeah. Um, okay. And so what does your next few days look like before you go um, up into space? And I'm so sorry. I've got a sick kid at home. So if you hear him squirreling in the background, that is what's going on. <laughs> so from here, I have a couple more days in Star City. And then next Tuesday, we'll fly down to Baikonur. And that will start our quarantine period for the two weeks before launch. And um, during quarantine, we continue to have a, a little bit of training every day. Um, and then there's uh, different events. We'll get to see our spacecraft for the first time, um, put on our, our real space suits and climb into our real spacecraft. Um, so that'll be really neat. And then uh, we just have a, some quiet time leading up to launch on September 15th. Um, are your family coming to see the launch? They are. Yeah, they'll get there a couple days before my launch. Um, so I'll get to see them uh, from a distance since I'm in quarantine, but it'll be pretty amazing to see them in Baikonur. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and is there anything in particular about liftoff that uh, you're looking forward to or a little uh, uh, worried about or uh, excited about, um, you know, that moment of engines ignite in particular? Um, yes. Yeah, so I've been told that it happens a lot slower than you'd expect. So you hear the engines ignite um, you're, and but then you just kind of, you feel like you're sitting there and just hanging there for a moment. And also, I got since I got to watch um, Frank Rubio's launch this time last year, I know, like, you see that. You see the rocket off in the distance, and you see all the smoke and fire. But for a couple seconds, it doesn't look like it's going to go anywhere. And then suddenly, it just takes off, and it's flying. And so I'm excited to experience that moment from inside the rocket this time. Yeah, And also absolutely. know that family and friends are, you know, standing there uh, also experiencing that as well, I think, will be pretty special. Yeah. Um, is there any experiments you're most looking forward to doing on the space station? Um, I'm looking forward to the variety of experiments that we'll get to work on. Um, there's no one experiment that I'm, um, you know, most excited to work on because um, I think they're all interesting. But I, there is one that I'm a part of because I'm the science experiment itself, um, and that it's called Cipher, and it's a human uh, research experiment that is studying um, all aspects of how the human body adapts and lives in microgravity. And so I'm looking forward to being a part of that. Yeah, um, and just as my last question, do you have any message you want to send to uh, Houston or to you know uh, any of your teachers back here or your friends back here? Anything, um, anything you want to say? Thank you for the support along the way. And I'm excited to share this mission with all of you. Awesome. Um, good luck. Have fun. Really appreciate your time this morning. Thank you.
Thanks. Hello, this is Marcy Frumker with the International Women's Air and Space Museum. Uh, nice to talk to you, Laurel. Um, I wonder if you can explain the significance to you that on your expedition, you and Jasmine will be the first ISS increment in all the years to have an all-female U.S. crew. Good morning, Marcy. Um, that's a great question. And I can say that I can't wait to fly with Jasmine. Um, she was She's one of my classmates. We both started at NASA at the same time. So it will be special, not just because um, we'll be um, – the only two U.S. astronauts, two women, um, but also because she's a really good friend of mine. Nice. And when did you decide you wanted to become an astronaut, go to space, and what was the influence of growing up in Houston, home of mission control? Well, I've wanted to be an astronaut since I was a little kid, since I was around eight years old. And NASA, um, having NASA Johnson Space Center down the road is definitely the source of that. Um, I always wanted to be an explorer and um, go to far off places in the world, um, meet people I've never met. But having NASA right there uh, really focused me on human space flight at an early age. Um, we had different opportunities to go to and visit the Space Center and then also um, just have the experience of, of seeing the space shuttle fly um, and seeing all of those missions play out as I got older um, in high school. And uh, speaking of your experience uh, in your work with underwater vehicles, how do you think that's helped prepare you for your space station mission? That's definitely helped prepare me. Um, some of my most favorite moments in my life have been at sea on research vessels. And I, some of the things that I take away from those experiences is um, just learning how to work in small operational groups. Um, so learning how to be a part of a team in a remote environment when you're far from home, um, the conditions are challenging, you might not be getting enough sleep, for example, um, and then also just having a very limited set of tools at your disposal. So learning how to solve problems um, with your creativity and the tools that you have on board um, are, all, are all skills that I will definitely take forward into the space mission. And uh, given the situation with the Soyuz uh, problems in the past, in your normal regimentation of training. How does a delay in your Soyuz flight of six months impact your training schedule? Um, so for me, I was pretty much ready to go in January when my mission got delayed, um, but I was able to put those six months to good use um, it, for me, um, just in continuing to do training. And then I got to get involved in a few other things at NASA in the same time, for example, uh, supporting some of the training for our newest class of astronaut, the astronauts, the flies, as an instructor astronaut. So um, I've got, and it just gave me a little bit more time to do things like study photography, um, continue working out. And so, yeah, it was a very productive, productive time for me. Excellent. And at the International Women's Air and Space Museum, we try to encourage girls to be interested in STEM education. So I was wondering, did you have a particular mentor as a girl that helped encourage your interest in the STEM fields? Um, yeah, there were a couple people um, for sure. One of one was my seventh grade science teacher, Mrs. Brown. Um, she took a lot of time to help me do projects on my own in addition to the schoolwork that we had. Um, and I definitely remember that. And then I also very much remember in high school getting to come to NASA and uh, watch some of the space uh, space shuttle mission debriefs. And one of those was Eileen Collins's mission um, when she was the first female commander. And so, see, you know, getting opportunities to see women in positions like that uh, was definitely inspiring. And since uh, this year we're celebrating 40 years since Sally Ride's first flight, can you reflect on the past feats of the early women astronauts um, and their influence upon you? Um, yeah, it's been amazing um, to, it's amazing for me to be a part, become a part of that legacy um, and have so many inspiring women to follow and learn from um, as we move forward. Um, from Sally Ride all the way to my classmates now um, who are all incredible and inspiring women that I'm, I feel very fortunate to get to be a part of. 
And uh, can you describe the most uh, difficult and the most fulfilling aspects of training for this mission? Um, that's a good question. I think as far as the most um, difficult aspects of training for the mission is just the breadth of subjects that we study and need to know about um, and just kind of jamming all of that information in your brain for future use. Um, and that's everything from um, the technical systems on space station to uh, photography to even medical skills um, because on space station we can't just go to the doctor. We are the doctors. And so um, that's challenging, but also one of my favorite parts about training. Um, and then the most fulfilling part, um, gosh, there's so many things. Uh, but one of the things that I've taken out of training um, that's kind of the most um, valuable and personal to me is just uh, the opportunity to um, live and train uh, with all of our partner um, countries on space station. Um, I think I mean, before, when I started at NASA, I gained a good appreciation of just um, how many people all over the world it takes to run the International Space Station. But it wasn't until I started training that I really, um, you know, felt how many people all over the world touch this mission. And it's everything from, you know, what kind of clothes are we going to wear to what kind of science we're going to do and, you know, how, like taking care of us if something happens on board. And so it's, it's just this amazing team of people all over the world and um, having a, an appreciation for that is really what I've taken out of training. Thanks, Laurel. And uh, one last question, since this is your first mission in space, is there something that you're most looking forward to on this flight? Yes, uh, I'm looking forward to everything, but I'm first looking forward to getting up into space and looking back on the Earth and seeing it from that perspective. I'm also looking forward to learning how to live and work in microgravity, um, just all the little parts of your day that become more challenging um, in a 3D environment. And then also all of the time that I'll get to share with my crewmates on board and also with the ground teams. Well, awesome. Nice talking to you. Thank you for your time and best of luck on your mission. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Laurel. Morning, Frank. Laurel, can you hear me? It's Frank. I How can. You can you hear me? <laughs> I'm good. How are you? I can hear you. There is like a there's like a five second delay, I think, but I don't know. I mean, you're in Russia, so that's probably acceptable. Yeah, it's it's kind of like practice for space station. All right. That's cool. Hey, we're going to, uh, I, I gave you a couple of those questions. Uh, I'll ask you about, uh, Nick Haig, uh, since we've talked to him before and, uh, yeah, okay. we'll go from there. Talk to you soon. We're going to all, gonna, we're going to be live.
A Jayhawk is headed to the International Space Station next month. Today we're joined by astronaut Laurel O'Hara, and she happens to be a friend of mine from college. She is live at Gagarin Cosmonaut Training Center in Star City, Russia. That's going to explain about the, like, five-second delay we have. But as you were telling me in the break, it's kind of good practice for talking to you in space. Welcome, Laurel. Thanks, Frank. It's great to talk to you. Laurel, I, we met each other in college. We were on the KU crew rowing team, but one of my fond memories was flying in a plane with you and trying to experience zero gravity over Clinton Lake by putting it into a stall. Now you get to go uh -huh. experience real zero gravity for like six months at the International Space Station. Tell me about this journey uh, from a, as a kid wanting to become an astronaut to actually seeing this uh, come through. Yeah, well, uh, it's funny because thinking about those floaties, you know, we got a couple seconds of microgravity when we were flying like that. Um, and one of the things that I think is just going to be crazy about this mission is sort of experiencing the start of that. So a couple seconds of microgravity and then it just doesn't stop for six months. Um, that's like one thing that I'm super excited about. But um, yeah, I start. I grew up in Houston, um, went to Kansas, like you said, to study aerospace engineering. Um, and I came up to Kansas uh, because I really liked the department. Um, it was small and I wanted to study aerospace engineering and it was kind of exactly what I was looking for, um, just an amazing department. And so that was really where I jump started this whole journey. Tell me about this mission that you're going to be on. What is your role going to be? I know there's going to be some experiments, some of which may even be performed on you. Yes. Um, so I'll be a flight engineer on Expedition 70. Um, as astronauts, we are trained to do anything that needs to be done on space stations. So uh, we get trained as the mechanics, we get trained as the scientists, uh, the technicians, the doctors. Um, so I'm looking forward to getting to do all of that. Um, you mentioned some of the research is on me. That's true. I'm part of an experiment called Cypher. Um, it's studying all aspects of the space environment on the human body, um, everything from uh, my bone density and how that responds to the psychology of how the human brain adapts to living somewhere that you can work on the ceiling. And you're going to be flying there on the Russian Soyuz rocket. Uh, Kansan Nick Haig has had experience on that. Have you talked to him about his experiences? Um, yeah, he was actually, we get to have a few meetings with astronauts who have also flown on Soyuz before us, and he was one of my mentors in those meetings. Um, so he shared all of his experiences uh, flying on Soyuz and then also working aboard the International Space Station. As you know, Wichita is a huge aviation community, and that's played a, a role in your life. What role has that played uh, is getting you to where you are today? Um, being living, getting to live and study in Kansas, that was that's just this huge center of aviation in the United States, was uh, really special. And at the time, um, as an aerospace engineer, it was just amazing to have all of those resources. Like I definitely remember. Um, going on school field trips or, you know, class field trips in college to Wichita and getting to tour all the different factories there. And I think that was definitely um, where my love of designing and building hardware and testing and, you know, um, testing and engineering operations came from for sure. By my count, you're going to be the fourth Jayhawk in space. What advice do you have for people who maybe uh, want to take a similar trajectory? Um, I would say don't be scared to take that first step. Um, don't be scared to try new things. Um, all of those experiences broaden your horizons and help you uh, learn more about yourself and learn more about the world. Laurel, best of luck, Godspeed, and Rock Chalk Jayhawk. Thanks, Frank. Rock Chalk.
Hey, Laurel, Stacy Clarity with Purdue's College of Engineering. All of us in West Lafayette are really excited for you to get to explore. Hi, Stacey, thanks. Yeah, uh, I'm sure you've been bombarded with texts and emails since the mission was announced. What kind of support have you felt from the Purdue engineering community? Uh, I, I've definitely received a lot of support from Purdue, um, just texts and emails from friends that I had while working there, and then also just the broader community in general. Um, obviously, uh, um, a lot of astronauts from Purdue and just a lot of enthusiasm and support in general for the space program. Many Purdue engineers talk about how their experience here prepares them for their careers and not just technical aspects of engineering, but in how they learn to think that problem solving kind of element. How has that shown up for you in preparing for this mission? And, and maybe how do you envision it helping once you're aboard the ISS? Um, I definitely had a great experience at Purdue um, doing research um, and learned a lot from my advisor, Bill Anderson, just in, as far as like how to approach a problem. Um, how to figure out what the right questions to ask are and kind of how to do that method, like work methodically um, through whatever it is, whatever problem it is you're trying to solve. And so um, I definitely think that's going to come in handy on board the space station as uh, I'm moving through my day, working on different research projects and um, solving problems on board. So you mentioned Bill, obviously you work with him at Zucro and a little bit curious, does being an aerospace engineer who focused on propulsion give you any unique insights into the launch? Like when you're sitting there thinking, you know, waiting for ignition, are you thinking fuel and valves and, and fluids? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely. I So after Purdue, I went into ocean science for a while. So it was it had been a, it had been a couple of years um, that I had thought about uh, the details, the nitty gritty details of rocket propulsion systems. So it's been a lot of fun studying Soyuz here in Russia and getting to dig back into some of that. We've talked quite a bit about your time here at Purdue and Zucro. And um, has there been a moment yet, or maybe there will be in your quiet time during quarantine in a couple of weeks when you've reflected on the places you've been, the opportunities you've had, the people you've met, you know, who have helped you to get to this point in this, you know, next really significant step in your career, maybe just kind of allowing the weight of what is going to happen to settle over you and how you got here? Definitely. Um, there have been moments like that so far. Um, they kind of creep in into the quiet spaces in between what's been a pretty crazy really last year of my life. Um, but I'm looking forward to having some more quiet time in bike in order to reflect on that. But uh, I am very grateful. I have had a lot of opportunities to live and work um, all over the country and now all over the world. And so I'm excited to um, get to see and honor all of those places from space and I'm just feel very fortunate to um, have gotten to know all those places the way that I do. You're one of those ridiculously talented and well-rounded people. Uh, I I know there you know the engineer in you and the adventurer in you is is really excited about this. But what about the artist in you? I mean, how much time do you anticipate getting? I know you said you're taking some journals. How how much time do you anticipate getting to be able to sketch what you're seeing? Um, I don't know how much time I'll have. I think we're going to be pretty busy. Um, but we, we do get downtime, and I am looking forward to spending that time. Uh, definitely looking forward to spending quality time in the cupola, um, either writing or sketching um, some of the thoughts and experiences that I'm having. It's funny. You kind of need to train your mind that anything you do in space now is going to be really valuable when you get back. And so, you know, those those sketches you do are going to be so sought off, so sought after. You know, that's just putting it in there, a perfect gift to Purdue maybe in a couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, it's easy. I can imagine it's easy for the days just to melt away um, when you're working all day, every day, and um, just kind of like fully engaged in the experiences that you're having. And so I want to be sure to capture those moments as they're happening. I, I know you mentioned that your parents and, and some of your family are going to be able to be there in Russia for the launch. How are they doing? How are your, your parents, your brother, your sister doing with it getting closer? Um, I, overall, they're doing good. I think the closer the launch gets, um, they're very excited to be able to come and see the launch in person. Um, and I think it's a mix of nerves and excitement um, because mm -hmm. kind of simultaneously, um, it's you're watching a loved one, you know, get to do something they've been dreaming about their whole life. And so there's that. But then it's also sort of this um, 
you know, kind of big, big thing that you're going up into space. And so it's a mix of emotions like it is for me also uh, when I think about both the mission and, and also think about them being there to see it and them being a part of all of this. It's very special. How many bo boxes of Tritskits have you packed? <laughs> I don't know. I asked for a lot, so we'll see what ends up there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for the time, Laurel. Great to speak with you again. Safe travel. Oh, Can't wait for you to visit campus. Tell us all about it when you get back. Maybe we can snag a chat with you uh, aboard ISS. That'd be great. I hope so. Thank you. Thanks, Laurel.